this is um, Baba John Henry Clark, um, and he's uh, introducing and speaking to uh, Brother Malcolm X and the impact that he had in, on his life and kind of his trajectory um, towards the end. Um, and then he ties it in to kind of the liberation movement that that spun off from that period of time, its roots and its forward trajectory it does an analysis, which is really um, phenomenal. And I, I encourage you to kind of check out what the what the the grand teacher has to say. On um, this man had turned down three and a half million dollars and whacked me on the shoulder and says, Swine eater, let me buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> he was more loyal to Elijah Muhammad than Elijah Muhammad eventually was to him. Elijah Muhammad was getting old and feeble and there was suspicion that Malcolm X would be the logical successor. And there were those within the nation who didn't want Malcolm X as the logical successor because Malcolm X would have done some serious house cleaning. He was an honest man, and there were some thieves in the house. I think his development as a Pan-Africanist came a little later in his life. In the final analysis, he was as good a Pan-Africanist as any of the rest. We have to have the type of understanding of Africa and the type of understanding of our people here in order to build a bridge, a contact, a line of communication between the two. And once the lines of communication have been established and our African brothers can, can, can um, stretch forth their hands and reach us, and we can stretch forth our hands and reach them, why there's nothing that this blue-eyed man in this country will be able to do to you and me successfully from that day onward. Malcolm X had laid down a threat to the colonial powers of the world it is nationalism that's bringing freedom to oppress people all over the world. It, is, it was nationalism that brought freedom to the Algerians. It was nationalism that brought freedom to the Nigerians and to the Ghanaians. I do not think Malcolm X's murder was a local American thing. I think it was a larger thing than that. I do not think that Farrakhan had anything directly to do with the murder, but I do think Farrakhan is guilty of creating the attitude and the atmosphere that led to the murder. Without Farrakhan, Malcolm X, I think, still would have been assassinated. We were friends from the day we met until until his death. I, when I got the word of his death, I was in Connecticut and going up to make a speech in Connecticut, and I was at a Jewish home. Someone announced that he died, and then someone added, dismissing the whole thing, that after all, he was anti-Semitic. I know the man well enough to know that he really didn't hate anybody. He hated certain things people did. He wasn't a hater at all, and they spoke as though they had the right to tell us who should and should not be uh, be our hero. I went into that bathroom and it was after dinner and just cried like a child for 15 minutes. And I came out partly composed and made the speech that night I was asked to make and came on home and began to try to deal with the uh, reality of the situation. Because to me, Malcolm X was not gone, and he's still not gone in my imagination. The whole year after his death, uh, I always got the feeling that 
we were having our usual conversation, I was always in it. What can I do? And finally, I got the feeling that he had said, do your best work. I was a good teacher before that. I was a better teacher and a better human being after that because I knew that being a good classroom teacher was my best work. <laughs> Call Baba <a> swine eater. <laughs> Individuals do not create rebellions, conditions do. Until they begin to adjust themselves to those conditions, rebellions will continue and they will escalate. And to fight for our liberation by any means necessary. It was the beginning of the Black Power Movement. It was also the Black and Beautiful Movement moving into second gear. I would like to think that wearing the Afro, wearing the African clothes, was a move toward Africa. To some extent, it was a form of African consciousness, an African awakening. As a result of it, African people were stimulated throughout the world. But what followed the stimulation? What institutions came out of it? What of lasting value came out of it? I do not think the Africans, the Caribbeans, or the Black Americans have studied with any degree of depth and seriousness the rise of modern Japan. They went into a war and they lost. They sustained two atomic bombs. They had that country occupied now the people that defeated them are now begging them for commercial space. Check, check. check it out. What did they do that we have forgotten how to do? Yeah. They did some serious, astute planning. Not loud mouthing. Not boasting. They did not get on the radio or any platform and call anybody any name. So they did what they had to do. If we're carrying out a well-designed program for liberation, if it's written out, any literate person can contribute and share leadership. So if the leader dies while you're on page 13, Move to page 14 and continue the struggle. Mm -hmm. Bear the man, continue the plan. You hear me? I think every person that calls themselves a leader, a preacher, a policymaker of any kind should ask and answer the question in his own lifetime, how will my people stay on this earth? How will they be educated? How will they be schooled? How will they be housed? And how will they be defended? The answer to these questions will create the concept of enduring nationhood because it creates the concept of enduring responsibility. That man just said what Malcolm X said is the fuel upon which everything that we have done at the Ledge Group is predicated. We must produce and control for ourselves food 
clothing, shelter, water, health care, and security. If you do these things, then all of their issues, all of the other ails, all of the other problems which face us as a people disappear. If you control those elements, the very things that a human being needed three million years ago are the same things that have us as slaves to convenience in someone else's home. We're eating poison food that's designed for the base genetic material, not for the superior genetic material. We're eating foods and drinking things that do not have the nutrient that is required to optimally maintain our physiology. We're using medicine that is designed based on the SLC24A5 genetic mutation tested on that mouse and then perfected to accommodate the weakest genetic material. And we take that medicine, we assume that medicine is going to do the same thing because we both have 10 fingers, 10 toes, two eyes, two ears, a nose and a mouth. And we assume that the medicine produced for the weakest genetic material will work for the strongest genetic material in the same way. And so we might as well go into any random individual's medicine cabinet anywhere in America, go into that cabinet, open up randomly a bottle, take out one of those pills and pop it in our mouth because we have a cold for as specific as that medicine is to us as a people. There is nothing. You may walk outside of your door. There is not one bus. There is not one park. There is not one bench. Not one business. Not one corporation. Bank. Uh, circus. There is not one thing that was ever built for you. Nor for your father. Nor his. Nor his. Nor his. What our teachers just said was that if we connect between our own people that have resources throughout the world and we create partnerships, we will form the strongest entity the world has ever seen. We number in one billion people across the planet Earth. There is absolutely nothing that could stop us. These are the words of Marcus Garvey. I'm not... This isn't original ideas. You must understand, this is not original ideas. If I'm sharing this to illustrate the fact that this is not original ideas. This is what Marcus Garvey said. This is what Malcolm X was saying. This is what our teachers have been saying throughout our time. And you're listening and you're quoting, but you are not putting into, into practice the things that have been said to you over and again. We form the single strongest and largest entity in the world if we are galvanized. If we just decided to do one thing, if we as a group decided to do one thing, right or wrong, it would change the entire trajectory of the planet Earth. Why aren't we moving? Why don't you hear that drum beat, man? Why ain't you hearing this? All right, I'm, 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 I'm gonna let you be peace. All right, I just wanted to, you know, share some of the words of the illustrious teacher, and I'm, you know, it is foolish of me even to have my voice go behind such great men. But I think it was important to kind of highlight um, the relevance of what was said so long ago, repeated and presented to you right here and right now. Food, clothing, shelter, water, health care, and security. I don't care what else anyone brings up. No matter what, if tomorrow those things are not provided to them, their education means nothing. Their, their economic plans for the future, which which count on their master providing them food, clothing, shelter, water, health care, and security for tomorrow will fail. If their plans speak to an educational institution in America that is going to produce 
for us scholars that are going to be able to move us in there. And you're counting on your enemy to provide for you food, clothing, shelter, water, health care, and security. Your plan will fail before you began it. Marcus Garvey said, any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave you. Any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave you, is what he said. Now look along the landscape. Look at the landscape. How many of them are telling you a permanent solution? Maybe not one that you're going to see in your life. I might not see it in my life. But we are building, you are seeing, we have food, we have maternity wards, we have water, we have security. We are slowly building those things that ensure permanent solvency into the future for your seeds and mine forevermore, no matter who likes it. And that is the resolve that I seek. That's the only thing that, that's going to work for me, man, for real. I can't. I ain't mean to get high. Peace, man. Love.